So the, the first slide actually illustrates uh, two low-dimensional systems I will be talking about. I will slightly touch nanowires and I will continue with two-dimensional materials, namely graphene. Uh, however, before I dive into the talk, I have to give credit because credit is definitely needed here. As although I'm the sole presenter, this is a teamwork. And the team uh, consists of uh, very talented students, which we have at, at our university, uh, namely Tomáš Pechal, Tomáš Musálek, and Lukáš Kachtí, who work on the nanowire topic, and Kristina Bukvišová with Martin Komařík, uh, together with, with the newbie Vojtěch Mahel, who work on the two-dimensional materials. And uh, I also have to thank Tomáš Šikola, as he gives me a lot of freedom in, in what I do. Uh, I will be also showing some work of my colleague, Petr Babor, uh, who do uh, ultra-high vacuum scanning electron microscopy together with uh, his students. And uh, we are uh, greatly supported by the Thermo Fisher, uh, by Libor Novák and Tomáš Vistavil, who actually help us with the instrument design and integration. I will show some recent work we did together with uh, Jan Ming Wang from MIT. And I have to also mention Hujun Wang from ETH, who is actually our advisor on the uh, graphene growth. So first I have to explain the title of my talk. Uh, as uh, I have been confronted with a question recently, why it is important to, to see the formation of nanostructures. And the, although you can answer that in many ways, my answer is based on the, the image you probably have seen in, in some course on, on physics on, in a high school or in the university. Uh, this is the first transistor and uh, it was built with germanium. So the question at that time could be, okay guys, why, why to explore new materials for, for transistors since we have this working transistor and it performs very well. And you know that the, that the answer is because germanium is a very poor semiconductor or it's a specific, some specific properties. And actually there has been a lot of research towards uh, different materials uh, to get uh, to the state of, of nowadays where the electronics is based on, on silicon. So actually what, what, what happened is that the germanium was dismissed and uh, there was a lot of uh, research on crystal growth of silicon. And actually silicon is now probably the most uh, perfect man-made material which, which mankind actually can prepare. So this is the reason why it is important to perfect the materials, although nature offers uh, perfect ones. And for example, in 2D materials, this is evident that you can exfoliate almost perfect monolayers of, of any 2D material you can think of. However, it's very difficult to prepare, it, uh, uh, prepare some of them artificially. These, and there are two other sayings I have to mention here. The most favorite one of, of mine is what Lord Kelvin said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, which is kind of for experimental physicists real true. And uh, I have to explain the word microscopy in my talk. So it's clearly uh, another saying uh, which everyone knows that, that is seeing is believing. So in fact, you can modify the, uh, the, the words of Lord Kelvin. If you can't see it, you can't improve it. And that actually gets me to the last uh, note on the, on the title. And that's why do we do in situ spinning electron microscopy? I have a bit difficult position now, since you have heard a beautiful talk by Lothar and you have uh, heard another beautiful talk by, by Ido, and both are using transmission electron microscopy. And I will illustrate the issue I, of, of scanning electron microscopy on the nanowire example, which will be the first material system or low dimensional system I will speak about. So, so nanowires were introduced in 1964 by Wagner and Ellis, namely this vapor liquid solid process, which is used uh, till today to produce the most uh, high quality nanowires of semiconductor materials. And the process is, is based on a really simple idea. So you need a substrate and you need the uh, metal particle. And uh, you heat up the system and uh, the metal particle will come uh, to, to act as a collector of material you will start to feed into the growth reactor. And it could be gas, it could be atomic uh, vapor, whatever. 
the, the metal nanoparticle particle will start to collect the, 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 the atoms you, you deposit. And very soon we will become supersaturated with this, uh, with this element. And after reaching the supersaturation, actually the thermodynamics of the system will force it to nucleate the, the excess material below, below the droplet. And that is how the nanowire grows with the catalyst or maybe you can say collector uh, droplet on top. So this is the vapor liquid solid system, which was introduced in 1964. However, the understanding of, the, of this process came when uh, electron microscopy focused its attention to this, to this process. And there are many papers uh, occurring in science and nature showing how, how this works. I have just one example, like two years ago, where you can see here, how the, the layer by layer addition of the atoms below the droplet occurs and how the nanowire elongates. And if you, for example, tilt the sample in TM slightly, you can see in even three dimensional view of how the layer actually grows below the droplet. So now comes the question, why do you use scanning electron microscopy? Well, when, when these images are around, and I have to say one thing, which is probably clear to, to anyone who has used the scanning uh, electron microscope or transmission electron microscope, that uh, the team guys are very picky concerning the samples. While in SCM, you could put almost anything. And that, that's the point here. So that the first uh, animated sequence I, I show here is uh, germanium nanowire, which is catalyzed by gold. Gold droplet is this object sitting on top of a nanowire. And you see the growth from the very beginning, which is something you can't see in, in the TM simply because you have no substrate in TM. And this, is, this image shows the substrate and the nanowire growth from the very initial stage up to the elongation stage. And this is the reason why SCM is useful here, because you can image the, the growth of materials which re require substrate. And indeed for 2D materials, this is almost Mandatory and it's extremely difficult to find a find a system where how you can image group of two-dimensional materials inside a TM. And that's why we use SCM. And uh, by the way, I will show no atoms so that some people may consider my talk not being microscopy, but I stand for it. What kind of information you can get from real-time microscopy? So there are actually, from my point of view, two kinds of two kinds of information. First one is that you get a real quantitative data on the, on the system you are actually studying. So this is the same image sequence. Clearly what you can get from the, from the uh, images is you get the growth rate. And if you plot it against, for example, for example, droplet diameter, and you have a model to fit, which is shown in here, which is what we normally do and what we can do. You get, for example, information on, on type of material transport, which in this case is surface diffusion, or you get real quantitative data. In this case, the fitting constant for this model is, uh, uh, is the diffusion length. And I have to stress out that the, true, that the, goal well, that the growth velocities we get are true ones, and they are, they are not compromised by systematic errors. Because for example, you can see such graphs in studies which do not use real time measurements, uh, they just grow nanowires, measure their length, and from growth time, they somehow try to deduce what is the growth rate. This is all wrong because there is a systematic error caused by, for example, nucleation delay. So the first kind of information you get is the quantitative data. The second kind of information you can get is uh, how, how does the structure actually evolve towards its final shape? For example, if you look in here, this is indium arsenide nanowire, and the question is how can nanowire have this shape? And in here, for example, uh, one considers the nanowire as having a smooth side walls. However, why this nanowire has this zigzag rim on the side wall? Another example, which I will talk about later on, is for example, when two nanowires meet, why in some, some cases the droplet after the collision splits into two nanowires, or it stays and the nanowire continues as one merged nanowire. In 2D materials, it, it is clear. 
So the question is, how can fractal shape evolve? How can this hexagonal shape evolve? What are the growth conditions for these for this, uh, shapes? For example, the, the spirals, which are sometimes seen in, in, uh, in papers who actually show the growth of 2D materials, are usually explained by some kind of cartoons where people just uh, try to derive the, the growth mechanism, but no one has seen it, if it is really true. And the last example shows what happens if two misaligned uh, hexagonal boronite tri domains meet and how this really very complicated, twisted uh, structure can evolve. And I believe all this can be explained very, in a very nice way by, by scanning electron microscopy if performed in real time during the growth. So that I will show actually two approaches we, we pursue towards the uh, in-situ real-time observation. So the first one I will talk uh, is the uh, kind of molecule beam epitaxy inside NSCM. So this is high vacuum technique that uses the evaporation from a solid state. You evaporate flux of atoms to the sample and by this, by this technique you can grow nanowires or other two-dimensional materials. Another approach is so-called chemical beam epitaxy, where instead of evaporating from a solid state, you introduce gaseous precursors. For example, ethylene to grow graphene, and I will show you an example of, of such type of growth and observation. However, real CVD systems are usually systems where the pressure is much higher than high vacuum, even the atmospheric one. And uh, this is something where we are trying to get so this is our goal, and I will show you some examples of how we are pursuing the way towards this kind of system. So let's start with the evaporation in high vacuum. And uh, I will show you what, how, how we modify the common SCM to, to, to get the results we actually have. So first thing you need to heat, heat up the sample because all these growth processes are performed at, at uh, elevated temperatures. So, uh, we use a PBN heater, which can heat up the sample up to 1000 degrees of Celsius. Then you, if you want to grow, you just take a piece of, of, of uh, silicon or germanium wafer, you add the gold to catalyst from, from gold collate solution. Then you need to evaporate the atoms. You take uh, an NPS cell and attach it to a microscope. Then you need the electron beam, which is clearly what is offered inside any SCM, a unit detector. And the detectors we use are not any special ones. We don't work in, in environment SCM mode. We use just high vacuum detectors. And the system then looks like this. This is the pole piece. Uh, somewhere here is hidden the heater with the sample. This is the evaporator. And you, and you close up the lid and you can start to work. So first example I will show this is the uh, unusual nanowire shapes we get and how to ex explain what was happening. So normally, I've shown this sequence, you would explain nanowires having smooth sidewalls. However, in, in certain uh, growth experiments, we do get nanowires which have this, this complicated shape. They, they have hexagonal cross section and on three sidewalls, we have this hot shape. And we were wondering what was happening during the growth. So actually what we've seen, is this behavior. You can first look at the, uh, at the image sequence here and what you clearly get is that the droplet does not sit on the top of the droplet on the, of the nanowire. Uh, it moves, it makes some kind of a dance around the nanowire, spreading on one of the side walls and staying on top for a while and do this in a rep repetitive manner. And what actually the, the the, the image sequence is in detail shown in here. This is kind of a side view. This would be the top view. And you see that from time to time, the droplet initially on top facet of the nanowire spreads also to the side wall. Then it jumps back to the top. Then it jumps to the side wall, which is behind, which is in here. Then it jumps back. And then it starts to spread the side wall, which is in, in, this, in this direction. And then the droplet again, jumps on top and this is round and round and this is how the nanowire grows up. So this is quite surprising. Uh, this was a kind of surprising uh, conclusion for the nanowire community that the drop bit is actually not in steady state. It actually evolves during the growth and even if it makes such a move, the nanowire can grow still in the, in the same growth direction. Now I will explain this. 
And uh, what is necessary to, for the explanation is to remind you that actually the growth occurs only below the droplet. So if the droplet wets the top interface, only the top interface can, can grow. And if the droplet wets also the sidewall, also the sidewall can grow. So this is in schematic what all happens. So we are on the top. So only this is the side view, this is the top view. So, so only the top facet can grow. So, well, when this facet is growing, and since these facets are not uh, perpendicular to the growth direction, actually the top facet is uh, shrinking. And the shrinking actually causes the droplet to unpin from this edge and wet also this side wall, which is shown in here. Now this uh, uh, facet can grow and this side wall can grow, which actually uh, enlarges the top facet. And then the droplet jumps back again to the top and only this facet grows. And that's how the growth happens. And uh, the interesting uh, physical point from this is that you probably heard about Young's, Young's equation, which is taught in basic uh, physics courses. Well, what uh, should be known uh, as well is that this uh, equation is valid for an ideal smooth surface. And the point why I'm showing it in here is that actually, if you know the surface energies, which are constant in this experiment, then there is only one wetting angle allowed. But clearly this is not the case in here where the wetting angle changes a lot. So, so on rough surfaces, we have this Gibbs inequality, which says that the wetting angle can vary in in, in an interval between the red, uh, receding angle and the advancing angle. This is exactly what we see in the experiment. And uh, this is not just the cartoon. This is real simulation using surface evolver. And you can see that the simulation perfectly matches with the shape of the droplet that we see in, in the scanning electron microscope. Now, uh, what happens if the droplet stays on the sidewall as well? So this is uh, the end experiment of this. So the nanowire grew in this direction, which is one, one, one. And then after the movement to this side wall, it stayed there and grew in a different direction. And what we, what we see from top is that, for example, this is the top view and this is the droplet. And the, the, the shape of the top interface is marked in the, by the red line. And you can see that the, in this case, the droplet wets just one half of the top interface. So this actually facet grows and it shrinks. So when it is too narrow, the droplet moves and it wets now the whole nanowire top. If since this angle is uh, too small, the droplet actually uh, paints to this edge and now this actually the, the top facet grows. I can continue, and this is like, uh, again, some kind of a droplet dance on top of a nanowire where actually the nanowire grows up using this droplet dance. And this is the explanation of why the nanowire has this zigzag rim along the sidewall. So this was one example. The second example I will show with, with the nanowires is, is the what happens when two nanowires meet. We sometimes see that uh, they follow to grow as one nanowire with bigger uh, droplet on top. And we sometimes see that the droplet on top splits after collision and the two nanowires grow uh, after the collision. So we found out that this is really dependent on temperature and with increasing temperature, we see more types of the splitting of the droplet. And uh, I asked Yang Ming Wang from MIT to do some kind of uh, phase speed simulations and he was able to simulate did this process very nicely. So at kind of lower temperature, he also sees after collision that the nanowires actually merge and grow as one. And at higher temperature, there is higher probability that the droplet will split. And uh, what was really strange on this uh, simulation is the droplet shape that actually he got from the simulation. So you can see very strange droplet shapes, which actually on the first side does not seem to be real. But our microscope experiment proved that this is real experiment. Uh, this is a real effect. So this is how we spotted the, the nanowire merging event. This is how we spotted the splitting event inside an SCM. And if you, re if you recall the, the image from, from the Young Ping simulation and the one of the frames from this sequence, you see 
almost perfect match that the drop it can have really strange shape. And there are more examples how actually electron microscopy in, in real time can justify uh, a vertical model. So this was the evaporation in, in a high vacuum. I will show you a movie now, which Peter Barbour did, uh, and it, this one deals with the catalyzed decomposition of ethylene and graphite. So what Petr actually and his uh, students operate is the ultra high vacuum spanning electron microscope, which has a base pressure uh, in 10 to the minus 8 range of uh, pascals. Uh, and uh, what they did is they took the platinum, cleaned it in hydrogen uh, at very high temperature, and then they actually admit uh, ethylene into the chamber. And we're expecting to grow graphene, and the idea behind this experiment is to grow not a single layer graphene, but a bilayer graphene in a, in a monocrystal shape. So I will run the video. So first what you see is the, how the first graphene layer grows. So you see two grains, they merge. And then on the left side, the left part of the animation in here, you see multi-layer growth of graphene. So each contrast uh, uh, is actually uh, uh, reflecting one of the graphene layers and what guys did i stop now the the, uh, the video and run it again what guys did they decrease the temperature which leads to the composition of the additional layers and left just the grain uh, of the second layer this one and then if they continue to grow this grain will start to uh, to enlarge and finally, they are able to cover the, the platinum with the bilayer graphene. It's still not perfect. Uh, those who actually uh, have seen some, some graphene papers on, on bilayer graphene are aware of the fact that this is not a single crystal. That definitely because of this shape, uh, this is a still uh, brain boundaries, etc. But Petri is now perfecting this growth. And what can you learn from these from these experiments is how how the dynamics and uh, kinetics of the growth proceeds. And uh, since this is ultra high vacuum microscope, they are actually able to, uh, to, to study the effect of different gases like oxygen and, uh, and for example, hydrogen, which is not possible if you would use environmental STM because there is uh, always water vapor which you cannot get from. Uh, this was fine. However, in order to get real CVD into the SCM, you need to increase the, uh, the pressure. And I will show you how we do this. How we do this? The first uh, actually approach we, we uh, use is uh, known from TM. And that's the microelectromechanical system. So we have a small chip which has a small heater in here, which is shown shown over here. This heater is actually capable of heating up the sample up to 1,200 degrees of Celsius with extremely fast heating rate. And what we do is actually that we uh, put the chip into the holder and we have this slit with a small aperture on top to see the sample and at the, at the side to introduce gas. And if we close it, it looks like that. And we can get up to 500 Pascal inside this, this very small reaction chamber. And then the question is obviously, how do we get the bulk sample onto this chip? So, what we do is that we put the bulk uh, uh, platinum into FIB, focused ion beam. We cut out the so-called chunk. We take it out using the micro manipulator, and then we clean it and put it onto the heater, which is shown in here. This is the three-dimensional view. And this actually means that you have now a bulk uh, substrate for growth of two-dimensional material. And I will again show you a graphene example. So this is platinum sample. Again, it was cleaned in, in hydrogen. And we introduce uh, ethylene uh, while hydrogen is still in. So here you will see what, what uh, kind of uh, information again you can get. So the, the dark uh, contrast means a monolayer graphene. And uh, what you can do, uh, with, for example, with these experiments that you can change the pressure of ethylene. And you see it in here, if you decrease the ethylene pressure, the graphene starts to edge. If you increase the ethylene pressure, graphene starts to grow so that you can play around between etching and, and growth. You can etch away the graphene almost fully and start to grow again. Like you have seen, now we start to grow again. 
fully etched graphene, and then we introduce a lot of ethylene and we see full graphene layer growth. And this is now getting very close to the real CVD system with a very high pressure, at least from scanning electron microscopist point of view. Now the last example I will show is the uh, graphing growth of molten gold, which uh, we actually attempted to a few uh, weeks ago. Oh, uh, and actually what, what you can see in here are the two domains on the semi-liquid gold, where one, which is this one, in the video is this one, shows uh, hexagonal growth of graphene. So this is a, this is a graphene, which is the, the growth, which is limited uh, by the attachment kinetics. And in here, you will see fractal growth, which is limited by diffusion. So actually, we can see the growth of graphene in two different modes on one single sample at the very same condition. And these kind of studies, I believe, are very helpful for, for the uh, growth optimization of monolayer uh, two-dimensional materials. I have shown you just graphene, but we are heading towards the more let's say advanced uh, materials like uh, transition metal dichalcogenide. And this actually uh, brings me to conclusion. So uh, uh, maybe better than conclusions, these are takeaway impressions. So I have shown you that we are able to, to monitor the growth processes of nanostructures in, in high vacuum SCM. And uh, I have also shown you that we are able to work uh, at, at low within so-called low pressure CVD mode, where we just add uh, a gas precursor to the SCM. This is also possible. And uh, uh, so that actually this illustrates that the scanning electron microscope, from my perspective, is a nice toolbox for, for growth of nanoscale materials. Because I have to remind you that the SCM is not just a microscope similar to TM. There are many more techniques you can apply during the growth, like uh, EDX, like the EBSD, etc. And we are working on together with Thermo Fisher on, on application of these uh, techniques uh, during the growth. And uh, we are actually heading uh, towards mimicking the CVD so that high pressure really high pressure uh, processes and how can they be imaged in an SCM. And the dream is to, to get the same uh, conditions as people observe normally in, in CVD tubes, like, like for example this one. And this is uh, obviously not a very simple task, so if you are interested in having PhD or postdoc with us, definitely let me know. Uh, if you would be interested to see uh, how your material grows, uh, I would be happy to discuss and maybe try to, the growth in uh, one of our systems. So definitely contact me. And now uh, I would be happy to uh, take and answer any questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, I don't hear anything. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to combine it with, with electron diffraction? Yes. Uh, we actually, I haven't shown this, but uh, we are able to do uh, EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction, using pixelated detector. This is, this is something new which was developed at Thermo Fisher, and we work on, uh, on uh, actually in, putting it into the uh, in situ, we are able to image up to, I think, 300 degrees Celsius uh, at the sample so far. Not higher, but this, uh, I believe, can be improved. Okay, I, I apologize. I have been un un unmuted, so you haven't heard me. So there is also another question given by Amon Rotman, if there is any effect of the electron beam on the growth. Yeah, that's, uh, th this question is always almost the first one uh, I'm asked. And uh, obviously we are aware of it. There are systems where the electron beam effect affects the growth and there are systems where uh, it does not. For the systems I have shown uh, so far, uh, we haven't seen any electron uh, beam effects, which is something we uh, normally do and we check it, obviously, uh, during the experiments. And there are systems uh, where this actually has a large effect. For example, 
uh, in perovskites, which is something uh, Amnon, uh, who asked, is also working on. We see a really uh, strong electron beam effect, uh, which actually kind of uh, un disables us from uh, seeing the growth of perovskites inside an SCM, because what is what grows below the beam is almost uh, immediately destroyed. So this is something one has to take care of uh, during the experiment, definitely. But it is possible. There are, there are many ways how to avoid it. 